This podcast was produced by ORFM Dunedin with support from New Zealand On the Air. The young shining cuckoo is fed by its foster parents on insects and spiders. But the korimako, or bellbird, has a much more interesting diet of nectar. It's been something of a radio personality and has sung on shortwave radio to Australia and the Pacific nations for 30 years. However, the early recordings failed to reflect the versatility of the bellbird with its wide variety of liquid notes and artistically placed clicks and bell-like sounds. It's not surprising that Maori mythology describes Korimako, the bellbird, as the messenger of Tane, sent to herald the coming of the sun. Community or chaos, we can construct and nurture community or fall into chaos. Over the next hour, Marvin Hubbard hosts conversations toward creating a fairer, more equal society. Community or Chaos is made possible with the support of Quakers Aotearoa. You'll find them online at quaker.org.nz. Well, good day, friends. Today we have Professor Stephen Zunas from the University of San Francisco in the United States in California. He's a expert on U.S. foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, and he's an advocate and scholar in the people power and nonviolence, and has served as a trainer and workshop leader for pro-democracy activists and organizers in the United States, Latin America, and the Middle East. Well, good to have you with us, Stephen. Oh, great to be with you again. You can podcast this, of course, by going to oar.org.nz and then going to podcast and going to Community of Chaos. It's been an interesting uh, couple of months, hasn't it? Very much so. I mean, the political dynamic here in the United States has uh, shifted dramatically. I mean, uh, just uh, a little over a month ago, Uh, Many people were resigned uh, to the likelihood of another Trump term, and uh, the um, authoritarianism uh, that uh, um, that would 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 follow with his uh, you know plans to uh, use extraordinary executive powers and then uh, Viktor Orban style uh, to uh, effectively um, you know uh, impose one man rule by uh, gutting the civil service and the judiciary and the FBI and pretty much uh, any government institutions uh, of um, uh, career professionals and replace them uh, with uh, with his cronies uh, and along with the Supreme Court decision that basically says that um, uh, you know, presidents uh, cannot be um, uh, uh, indicted for crimes committed while in office. Uh, many of us are preparing for the worse. And uh, now there's been, and, and Biden was falling behind in the polls and uh, things were not, not looking good. Uh, but then uh, when he finally stepped aside and Vice President Harris became the uh, incipient nominee and now she is the official nominee, uh, the dynamic has changed dramatically. Um, thousands and thousands of uh, new voters have registered. Uh, the uh, enthusiasm gap, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, the, the, what pollsters call it when, in terms of how um, excited people were about their respective uh, party's uh, nominees, uh, not only closed, but the Democrats are now way ahead in that regard. And uh, just the, the enthusiasm um, uh, has been, you know, quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, now, um, uh, Harris is, has a slight lead, and um, not not just nationally in terms of the popular vote, um, but uh, maybe actually pulling ahead in the elect and the prospective electoral college vote as well. Well, that's good news. Well, let's start with some some bad news, and we'll come back to the good news. Is um, have you been keeping up with things in the Middle East? Yeah, very much so, <laughs> and, it, it, and un- unfortunately, at least here in the United States, but because of the distraction 
of the uh, dramatic turns of events in terms of electoral politics. Uh, there has not been the attention on um, on the Middle East that uh, uh, that's uh, needed. The Israel's war on the people of Gaza continues. There have been continued atrocities of attacks on re- schools and uh, housing refugees, uh, medical facilities, assassinations of, of, of journalists, and ongoing uh, violations of international humanitarian law that indeed. Is American Secretary of State uh, Anthony uh, Blinken a bit over-optimistic about how negotiations between Israel and Hamas are going? Can you hear me? Perfectly clear with this um, um, much vaunted ceasefire proposal the United States put forward and was approved by the UN Security Council. Basically, uh, you know, they put it forward, Hamas accepts it, or at least uh, doesn't object to it. Uh, the Israeli government demands uh, uh, changes in its favor. The United States rewrites it in Israel's favor, says that Israel has therefore now uh, accepted it, even though Israel really hasn't. And But Hamas says, hey, you changed it. We agreed to the original one. They, they, they're not going to agree to these changes. So Israel says it's Hamas's fault that uh, there's no peace. It's Hamas's fault that uh, there is no ceasefire. And uh, Biden has done this repeatedly. I mean, he's outright lied, saying, if we just freed the hostages, the war would be over. Well, it, uh, Hamas has agreed to uh, free the hostages in return for an end of the bombing and withdrawal of Israeli occupation forces. Uh, but um, uh, Netanyahu has explicitly rejected that, saying he's going to fight to the end until Hamas is somehow uh, destroyed. Now, obviously, this is upsetting to a lot of people, including the families of Israeli hostages and others who desperately want them home. That's why there have been those huge demonstrations out there. But um, the U.S. refuses to pressure Israel by uh, threatening to withhold aid or anything like that. Do they think that they're going to actually get rid of all resistance by massive killing? I, I, I can't imagine they actually believe that. I mean, the, uh, the top Israeli uh, general staff, you know, the officers, you know, the, the leaders of the military uh, say that's impossible. In the Pentagon, the United States, um, you know, people recognize that that's, that's impossible. Um, I mean, uh, clearly Netanyahu just simply wants the war to continue. And it is incredibly upsetting that uh, the Biden administration has is, is absolutely refused to uh, a- acknowledge that. I mean, it's very it's interesting. If you look at, look at over the past ten and a half months, um, uh, the uh, initially the United States opposed any kind of ceasefire. In fact, vetoed a number of UN Security Council uh, resolutions to that effect. It was one of only nine countries in the 193 member General Assembly to vote against calls for a ceasefire. But there's so much pressure, both internationally and domestically. Finally, starting with Vice President Harris, uh, the uh, U.S. officials, including Biden himself, started saying, OK, we're for ceasefire. But it's, it's becoming increasingly apparent that what Biden means by a ceasefire is a temporary truce where all the hostages would be released, et cetera, et cetera. But then Israel could resume bombing, you know, within uh, six weeks or a few months or, 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 or whatever. Um, you know, something, of course, Hamas would be unwilling to, uh, to agree to. And in certain ways, the U.S. support for uh, a, a ceasefire is reminiscent of U.S. support for a two-state solution. For decades, the United States objected to a two-state solution. Until it became impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Republican and Democratic administrations opposed it. Biden, for most of his Senate career, opposed any kind of Palestinian state whatsoever. But when the the, the pressure grew uh, and the Palestine Liberation Organization agreed to accept only 22% of historic Palestine as their mini-state, Finally, the U.S. came around to supporting a two-state solution, uh, in, at least saying they did. And yet, once again, they refused to pressure Israel to make it poss- possible. They'll say, we will not condition military aid to Israel. We will veto U.N. Security Council resolutions that will pressure Israel. We'll even oppose civil society efforts like boycotts, divestment, and sanctions to pressure Israel. The only way there can be a two-state solution, says the United States, is for uh to direct bilateral talks between Israel and the Palestine uh, Authority, that is, to o- only on terms that Israel would agree to. But the Netanyahu government has explicitly 
uh, ruled out any kind of Palestinian state. And combined with the U.S. not refusing to uh, pressure them or allow anybody else to pressure them, that's essentially saying they don't really want a two-state solution. Similarly, I don't think the United States really wants a ceasefire, <laughs> because if they did, they have the means to pressure Israel to do so. Um, 80% of Israel's arms uh, imports are from the uh, United States. Uh, their own arms industry is dependent on uh, American uh, components and technologies. Um, the U.S. could easily bring this war to a halt, just as Obama halted two previous uh, smaller-scale wars that Israel had launched on, on, on Gaza, and as Reagan did with their invasion of Lebanon uh, in back in 1982-83, um, uh, you know, as, and, 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 you know it, it can be done if the U.S. chooses to, but Biden has refused to do so. That's a, a tragedy, both. It's a, it's a tra humanitarian tragedy. It's also a personal tragedy. That's what Biden will be remembered for. He won't be remembered okay. as a selfless gesture of, of letting the Democratic Party pick somebody who had a chance of winning. He'll be remembered for uh, ethnic cleansing, genocide. Yeah, and... Uh Exactly. And both you and I are old enough to remember Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, in terms of domestic policy, he was practically a social democrat. I mean, he was one of the most progressive uh, presidents uh, the U.S. has ever had. Everything from the civil rights uh, legislation to the war on, on, on poverty to um, Medicaid and Medicare. And I mean, all sorts of, of uh, programs that we take uh, uh, that we take for granted now. And similarly, Biden has had an incredibly progressive uh, uh, domestic agenda. Uh, but, uh, and, and he also, you know, stepped aside, you know, at, like Johnson did <laughs> um, uh, uh, when, he, when he was uh, in the re-election, during the re-election season. And uh, yeah, what, how do most people remember Lyndon Johnson? They remember Lyndon Johnson for the tragedy of the Vietnam War. And I think you're, you're correct. Similarly, I think uh, Biden, you know, has really destroyed his personal legacy uh, by his his key role in um, making possible uh, Israel's uh, war on the people of Gaza. Do you believe that countries and cultures can ruin their soul? I don't know what soul is, but I'm using the word anyway, by their violent actions. Well, well certainly. I mean, the, um, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the uh, nation that, created, uh, you know, Beethoven and, and Goethe ends up under the rule of the Nazis and the, and, 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 we, and, and, and what, uh, and we, we see what, uh, what, what, what happened there. Um, I mean, Israel, the impact I think is, is, um, I mean, w w w basically what has happened is years of occupation in order to justify the occupation, especially when the security rationales no longer were valid once the Palestinians, the Arab states, have all agreed to, you know, um, recognize Israel and return for an end of the occupation. It came down to basically a, 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 a racist uh, uh, attitude uh, that was uh, inculcated in the training of his Israeli forces. And every Israeli, um, you know, um, including uh, uh, non-Orthodox women, um, serves mandatory three years in the uh, Israeli uh, military uh, uh, at age 18 and um, required reserve duty, you know, for a month every year till they're 50. That's a lot of time in the military. And, and, and virtually all of them have served not in protecting Israel, not in defending Israel, but maintaining this brutal occupation and supporting these uh, colonists, these illegal settlements, in the occupied territory. In fact, the reason that Hamas was able to um, inflict that horrible, horrible attack of October 7th was that, uh, that, in, that uh, the, the troops that should have been guarding the border there were in the West Bank uh, supporting these right-wing settlers and these land grabs and maintaining these these checkpoints um, you know, uh, where Palestinians couldn't even go to one village or another without this, you know, this humiliating uh, uh, stoppages and the like. Um, so, yeah, that when, when, you, when, you're, when you've had a couple of generations at this point who have served an occupying army, it, 
it has the impact, uh, to, to quote Exodus, of hardening one's heart, if you will, and uh, and creating this kind of um, a, a, a situation where you know the the, the great the early ideals of um, of of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Israel, uh, a homeland for an oppressed people, uh, their their uh, democratic institutions, indeed their socialist institutions. I mean, labor Zionism was an explicitly socialist movement. Uh, the kibbutzim, these uh, uh, amazing uh, collective farms. I mean, all this. You know, they're, they're, I mean, and and and. and I mean, in certain ways, it parallels the United you American experience. I mean, the the founding of the United States was based on the ideals of the uh, in, Enlightenment. It was the uh, the first uh, representative democracies uh, in, in in the world, and and our progr- our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, was were the most progressive documents of, of their of their of their kind up to up to that that point. Well, at the same time, we were engaging in this ethnic cleansing and genocidal war against the indigenous peoples. So you do have this, uh, this contradiction, you know, that not to mention enslaving <laughs> millions of Africans. Uh, so you, you do have this contradiction, even, even when, when countries are founded by uh, in, in these, with these high ideals, if you're doing that kind of thing to other people, yeah, you, you, you mm. bet it can, you can, you can lose your soul. <laughs> Israel's founding is understandable after the, after the Holocaust, but in some ways, wasn't it a mistake because the Palestinians were already there and they were never they weren't recognized from the very beginning? No, no. And in fact, if you look at the early Zionist documents, even by these uh, self-proclaimed uh, democratic socialists, you know they you know they did see it as a colonial project. <laughs> um, and Zionism, of course, came out of the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, uh, where the nationalists in, in Europe. And the uh, nationalist movements in Europe at that period were explicitly mm-hmm. pretty racist, you know, and that's why they're justifying the scramble for Africa, and uh, and and another effort. So, yeah, and 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 one can certainly argue that, especially in the age of nationalism, that you know, uh, historically oppressed people, you know, ha- has, should have a state of their own, and that, uh, and and the mm-hmm. uh, national. This is a na- basically well, yeah. Zionism is a national liberation struggle for Jews, but you did have that inherent contradiction that it was indeed on somebody else's land. And I think one mm-hmm. reason that the new generation of, of diaspora Jews, and we're seeing this very clearly in the United States, are not nearly uh, as supportive of Zionism as previous generations, is I think in part uh, they're not only aware of what has been done in the name of Zionism, uh, but they are also, you know, we are in an era, we're kind of almost in a post-nationalist age there, uh, that, um, you know, that re- recognizing that uh, nationalism, uh, instead of liberating people, can create more conflict. The nationalist movements of our uh, our generation, Marvin, you know, were struggling against colonialism and neocolonialism and, 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 and imperialism. They were mostly progressive forces, but the nationalist movements today like we see in Eastern Europe, are pretty uh, reactionary and, and racist. And indeed, Netanyahu's form of Zionism is a lot more similar uh, to the kind of nationalism of, 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 of Viktor Orban or, or Putin or Lukashenko or, or Trump. <laughs> is, uh, is it a myth that uh, the Jewish people will population in America support Zionism and Israel. Is that partially a myth? I I mean, I I think uh, the majority of American Jews, especially older generations, uh, do, you know, support Israel and the idea of a Jewish state and that Israel has a right to exist. Um, But uh, much less so among uh, younger Jews. And and, and more critically, uh, the majority of Jews are are actually... uh, uh, disturbed at uh, the Netanyahu government and what it's been doing. They're concerned about the the war crimes, the, the violations of international legal norms, and are are frankly uh, uh, disappointed that uh, Biden hasn't uh, used a little bit of tough love, if you will, to you know pressure uh, Israel uh, to to stop the slaughter. Uh, you know, the, the, the even even a fair number of Zionist Jews in the United States would have more in common with the. Um, protesters out on the streets in Tel Aviv demanding that uh, uh, Netanyahu sign a ceasefire 
than the uh, the government that is currently in power there. Could you talk about uh, Rabbi M- Michael Lerner and the magazine Tucker? Let's yeah, and, uh, Michael, Michael Michael Lerner, uh, 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 who who is um is is um is on hospice at this point. He's he's not going to be with us much longer, unfortunately. Um, he's in his late seventies. Um, he's had quite a, uh, um, a quite a, a, a career. He was a uh, prominent anti-war activist. He was one of the defendants in the Seattle Southern um, conspiracy trial, um, and he where he was a, a young um, sociology professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, and he later became um, he, he, he later got a degree. Uh, 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 in psychology, because he was very interested in the questions of why uh, working class people would often vote against their their own economic uh, uh, in- interests and the like. Uh, but uh, as he got in his middle age, he got uh, uh, he he came back to his Jewish roots and uh, went to s- seminary and um, and became a rabbi. And he he, he pushed uh, this idea. You know that the one of the troubles with the left is just as as people on the right, you know, will will will, will stress personal morality uh, while uh, dismissing, um, you know, you know, social justice and 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 social responsibility. Uh, that the left was sometimes you know poo pooed um, concerns about individual morality and responsibility, and. Um, he, he he was he, he got the attention of the Clintons actually he was invited to the White House to, to meet with them um, in 1993 but the Clintons then quickly abandoned him when he started speaking out for Palestinian rights um, and um, he formed this uh, he started this magazine called Takun uh, which was an intellectual journal uh, primarily a Jewish audience but uh, but included uh, plenty of non-Jewish readers and, and, and including uh, non-Jewish members of the editorial board, like myself, um, and um, a- as well, and, and, and pushed uh, you know, issues, everything from uh, you know, global debt relief to um, uh, ending the uh, Israeli uh, occupation. Uh, but uh, he, so he was, he was a voice, an important voice at a period when much of the established Jewish community was uh, uncritically supportive of the Israeli government and was a, you know, it was a very, very, very uh, you know, a, a prophetic voice in many, many ways, willing to uh, not just, you know, challenge, you know, the base, base I mean, for example, when, it's talk, when he talks about uh, individual morality and responsibility, he, he, meant, he noted how corporate capitalism and this kind of competitive individualistic ethos was the very things that led to the breakdown of the moral order. It was not a matter of individual failings, you know, like the, the conservatives would have, but a, un, uh, an understandable byproduct of an unjust system. And so, um, yeah, he, 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 uh, he, he's, he's, he's been a very uh, in, influential uh, uh, figure. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to learn of his imminent passing. I guess he would have a lot in common with Rabbi Michael, I mean, with Rabbi Her- Herschel. Yeah. Would, um, so Judaism has had a lot of people that criticize Israel's actions as well as support Israel, and sometimes people that do both. Would that be the case? Oh uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So there's a um, and the the the. I mean, certainly, one cer- certainly one can uh, note the ways that um, Israeli actions are contrary to the, the, to, to the, some of the very basic values of, of Judaism, and that's why you had uh, organizations like uh, If Not Now and Jewish Voice for Peace. You know that have emerged and have a lot of support, uh, especially among young people. Um, but you know they're up against a lot of things in many ma- mainstream Jewish uh, congregations. You know there is real indoctrination around that Jewish identity is tied up uh, to the state of Israel and, and to Zionism, 
I rem- and uh, there's yeah. a growing. I remember growing when I was message. at um, in Pennsylvania, Swarthmore, uh, going to a retreat and Swarthmore meeting, a Quaker meeting. The Jewish uh, local Jewish community used Swarthmore meeting because the rabbi and the members decided to support uh, Israelis who would not go into the be, would. Reservists who would not go into the West Bank and support what was happening on the West Bank against the Palestinian people. And the uh, trust who owned the <coughs> synagogue said, oh, well, if you're going to take that attitude, you can't use this sun- your synagogue anymore. And so they ended up meeting at a Quaker meeting house on Fridays. Yeah, they, 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 and there's a, a fascinating documentary that's come up out recently called Israelism, uh, which is by American Jewish filmmakers interviewing American Jews about you know this whole whole process and and especially to to uh, a prominent uh, 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 Jewish activist who who changed their uh, change their perspective uh, and um, it's a uh, it's a very a very impressive um, film and and. One that again both both uh, looks at the, the indoctrination and the and the McCarthyistic view towards the centers, but also gives hope again that this younger generation are are starting to to rethink and and re- reevaluate and and recognize that uh, that that Israel sort of become the golden calf. It's become you know there's a kind of idolatry, a state uh, idolatry, which again is very very you know, con- contradictory. You know, to the uh, strong uh, moral and ethical uh, traditions of Judaism. It's a bit like Christian nationalism. Oh yeah, yeah, very much so, very much so. Well, I think it was some music, and then he'll come back. That was uh, Children of Darkness, and we're now going to continue our conversation with Professor Zunis from the. Uh, University of San Francisco on uh, New Zealand, I mean, sorry, American foreign policy and the Middle East and also American politics. You can podcast this by going to oar.org.nz and then going to podcast and then going to community or chaos. Stephen, could you talk about, um, is there a danger of a, Middle East wide war between Israel, the United States, and Iran. Briefly, certainly, certainly a, a possibility. I, I, I think that the, um, uh, the Iranians uh, would like to uh, avoid that. I think the um, Hezbollah and other Iranian allies would like to avoid that, primarily because they are winning the propaganda war right now. They have little to gain and lot to lose with a full-scale confrontation with Israel, which is far more powerful than, uh, uh, than, than they are. Uh, and because, you know, basically the Islamic world is seeing uh, uh, Israel engaged in this genocidal war against the Muslim people, directly supported by the United States and some other Western nations. They see the um, Arab st- uh, states uh, unable to do anything about it. And then they... Uh, and the, the only 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 uh, parties that are really sticking up for the Palestinians right now are Iran and its allies uh, on a small scale, or uh, you know, by, by uh, in the case of the Houthis and erupting, uh, dipping the Red Sea, in the case of Hezbollah, you know, lobbing these rockets into northern Israel and Israeli occupied uh, Golan Heights, um, and so yeah, yeah they, they 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 have. They, 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 they had no reason to want to expand it. Um, also, I think the, the United States, while willing to tolerate uh, Israel's war on the on the, uh, the people on, on, on Gaza, where Hamas really can't do a whole lot uh, uh, of damage, um, that uh, they know that a a you know a they don't do not want to be dragged in, in a large uh, regional war. Uh, the um, <clears throat> So, but you know, they're at the same time they're sending a, a mixed message. The U.S. says, "Okay, Israel, don't do anything uh, provocative. Don't launch this war. But if you do, we're bringing in these carrier groups. We're bringing in additional troops. We're uh, bringing in additional weaponry. You know, so it's it's hardly a disincentive. You know, and and you know, the U.S. making clear we will defend Israel. 
um, if uh, Iran retaliates or whatever. Um, so while and while I and I think also the again the, um, the top Israeli generals wouldn't be happy with a regional war um, or full scale war with with Hezbollah because because uh, Hezbollah, unlike Hamas, which has relied largely on um, on, on smaller uh, rockets, uh, kind of homemade or or some, or, 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 or some smaller uh, uh, rockets sent that they've gotten from Iran and elsewhere, the um, Hezbollah has this huge arsenal of thousands of, of very powerful missiles and, and that, that are able to uh, strike anywhere in Israel. They could do enormous uh, damage. They could kill thousands of Israelis, both uh, um, uh, military and, and civilian. Uh, they have them in these, these tunnels uh, that they can just uh, you know, uh, bring them out, fire them, and then bring them right back in. It becomes kind of a whack-a-mole type thing. Uh, if you look back at the 2006 so war, which was uh, the uh, you know, for, uh, last a full-scale war between the two, it's the first uh, Arab-Israeli war where the uh, Arab side killed as many Israeli uh, soldiers as the as the Israelis killed uh, Arab soldiers. Uh, the, all the other Arab-Israeli wars were, wars were really uh, one-sided in that regard. Now, the war was also, there was, that war was one-sided in terms of civilian casualties. Um, uh, you know, uh, many, many hundred of, uh, hundreds of Lebanese civilians died, and there was huge damage to the Lebanese uh, civilian infrastructure. It caused the largest oil spill in Eastern Mediterranean history. I mean, it was, you know, it was a horrible war. But, uh, you know, they, they proved that they could do a lot of damage and their arsenal is much, much bigger now than it was then. So um, there are good reasons for the Israeli military to not be be happy about that, particularly since the 2006 war was a direct result of pressure from the United States uh, as a um, as a means of, of curbing one of uh, Iran's closest allies. Uh, and of course, Iran got involved. That would be even more uh, more destructive. So. I, I, I doubt that it's going to be a full-scale okay. war. I think there are enough parties okay. who don't want it. At the same time, it's uh, these kinds of games of brinkmanship, you know, things can get out of hand. Okay. That uh, yeah. We've seen plenty of wars that have started, you know, when neither side necessarily wanted them. So it's still a very precarious situation. All right. What's happening politically in the United States to the left? Could you talk about New York Congressman... Janelle Bowman and Missouri yeah, Jamal, yeah. and Missouri Congresswoman Cory Bush. They both lost in the Democratic yeah. primaries. And it, was this due to the American the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee APEC donating? Well, these are two uh, these are two of the most progressive members of Congress. They'd only been in a couple of terms. And they are a part of this younger generation, especially uh, p- people of color, uh, who have joined the small but growing uh, members of uh, Democrats in Congress who are willing to challenge um, the uh, uh, the U.S. government's unconditional support uh, for uh, the Netanyahu government. And um, these are overwhelming Democratic districts. So, you know, there, there's there's no, no hope of a Republican winning uh, in, in these places. But... Um, uh, so they ended up supporting these uh, rather you know, hawkish, more you know, centrist, center-right uh, Democrats to challenge them. And um, you know, there there had been a push by the more mainstream wing of the Democratic Party to do this anyway, because both of them had defeated uh, more uh, traditional uh, incumbents when they first came. So this was there's there'd been a battle in those districts between the uh, more left and more moderate. Uh, wings of the Democratic Party already. Also, both of them were, had had some problems. Uh, Jamal Bowman, you know, had ended up setting off a fire alarm in the con- in Congress to delay a vote and got caught. Um, he, uh, he had mentioned that uh, he had, had implied some 9-11 conspiracy ideas and things that, that made him more vulnerable. Similarly, Cori Bush uh, was having a, a, um, a relationship with someone with who also you know, she may or may not have directed some government funds in his direction, and so they they, they were somewhat vulnerable already, um, and so uh, these the, the, the uh, these uh, right wing political action committees uh, um, 
allied with APAC, did indeed put money into their defeat, and they were both defeated. Now, they also tried to uh, defeat some other uh, progressive uh, Democrats, uh, who, but these were in a much stronger position, uh, and uh, they survived the, the challenges. So one could say that um, yeah, APAC arguably did play a role in their defeat, uh, but um, they probably they the APAC would not have been successful were there not some other issues that uh, that did make them uh, more vulnerable than than many incumbents. Tell us about APAC. And you know, it's the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. It's one of the most powerful lobbying groups in in Congress, and they also you know have this. Uh, uh, an ar- uh, electoral arm that supports uh, uh, campaigns. Uh, they primarily support Republicans because they are very right wing. Um, indeed, the majority of recipients were these far right Republicans that supported the uh, the, the uh, challenge to um, a Biden's election uh, back in January of of, uh, of uh, 2021, and. Uh, you know, but they also give to some of the more hawkish uh, conservative Democrats who are on their side. Um, there's also a more liberal Zionist lobby you know, called uh, the J Street, um, which is pro-Israel but anti-occupation. Um, you know, they tend to support Democratic uh, uh, in nominees. Uh, but APAC, uh, even the polls show m- more American Jews are closer to J Street. Uh, APAC, uh, because they have support of some you know, uh, very wealthy people, um, you know, it is uh, arguably more powerful and more influential. Now, they have created something of a climate of intimidation on Capitol Hill. Um, and, you know, they, again, very well organized and, and, and quite powerful. Um, at the same time, I, I caution those who, who tend to make the argument that they are responsible for, is, for the U.S. support for the Israeli government. Uh, because, you know, lobbies can can influence Congress, but, you know, they don't really, I mean, when it comes to foreign policy and the national security interests of the United States, you know, no, no, no president, no administration is going to consciously go against what they think is best for the national interest, you know, for the sake of a, of a lobbying group. Um, they, the, the, um, in, in, in times that presidents have taken on APAC, we think of Eisenhower and the Suez crisis, um, uh, Carter in the first Israeli invasion of of uh, of, of Lebanon, um, Reagan the AWACS deal to uh, Saudi Arabia, Obama and the Iran nuclear agreement, and several other examples. Uh, the president has always won. Um, you know the the foreign policy is very much an executive, the realm of the executive in the United States. Congress can react in certain ways, but they don't make foreign policy. Um, and, and indeed, when you think about it, I mean, the United States support Indonesia's occupation of East Timor. Um, they, we support Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara. We vetoed a series of UN Security Council resolutions against apartheid South Africa's occupation of Namibia. It's not like there are these uh, ethnic lobbies forcing our hand to do so. Similarly, the U.S. has supported genocidal wars by uh, you know, Pakistan against uh, Bangladesh, of uh, Guatemala against the indigenous people, Turkey against the the the, the, the Kurds, um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, just a few years ago, um, uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia in, in in Yemen, and of course, our own genocidal war in Vietnam. So what a, you know, it, yeah. it's um, it's, so it's again, it's, it's not like uh yeah you know, it's, 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 it's this idea the united states would suddenly you know be concerned about human rights or international law in the middle east if it weren't for apac uh, is kind of naive given the us is mm. you know, not really cared about those principles uh, elsewhere in in the world yes i'm, I'm sure so I, in other words I, in other words i don't think I, I think it's a mistake to exaggerate the power of apac both because i think it, it misses the analysis it doesn't look this, at the centrality of us militarism and imperialism and and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but also, frankly, I'm a little nervous when people exaggerate the power of, of, of wealthy Jews. It parallels historic anti-Semitism you know, that exaggerate Jewish power and in, in, in finance and in, in government and in, 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 in uh, business and, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, again, uh, yeah, APAC's, APAC has made it more difficult to challenge U.S. policy. If it weren't for APAC, we'd have more allies in Congress. There'd be less censorship. There'd be more debate. But 
they're not the cause of human yeah. policy. In APAC and NRA, aren't they examples of the overwhelming power of money, though, in elect American elections? I mean, it's the real, yeah, I mean, the real problem yeah, I mean, of APEC and the National Rifle Association isn't just their policies and the population they represent, but it's the money they represent and then what they able oh, yeah, to do with money in American oh, yeah. politics. Yes, very, very, very much so. I mean, the you know the um, you know I mean, we'd the, have, the National we'd Rifle have, Association. Uh, America would probably have gun regulations similar to Australia. Oh yeah, no, no question about it. But but the thing is, lot, I, I I don't doubt, don't question the power of the of the gun lobby. But the thing is, is that that's the, that's the difference between domestic uh, legislation and foreign policy. Is that um, the, again the the president has a lot more leeway, a lot more power. In, in foreign policy, they, they they can they can make all any number of executive decisions, such as yeah. uh, withholding uh, military yeah. aid to Israel because yeah, of violating. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with you Israel. about that. I think the yeah, um, yeah, yeah yeah the foreign policy establishment runs American foreign policy, not not lobby not lobby and I and I agree with you that money in politics is a big big problem. <laughs> I mean, it really threatens democracy in some ways, doesn't it? Uh, very, very much so. Very much so. What can then be done about that? Say, if by some miracle America ended up not only the uh, uh, the winning the presidential campaign, but also controlling Congress and Senate, what could they? Uh, are there things they could do to make America more uh, more actual a, a democratic country? Oh. Well, one of the big uh, one of the big problems um, on the campaign finance level is that uh, you know the uh, uh, Republicans have stacked the uh, the courts uh, with people who uh, believe that um, uh, f- uh, corporates and corporations um, and wealthy individuals uh, donating money is a form of protected speech. And you are denying people free speech by limiting the amount of money that they can give. Indeed, these courts have thrown out uh, the, uh, the, the limited campaign finance laws that had been on the books since the uh, Watergate and related scandals of the early 1970s. And so it's going to be a, a while, I think, <laughs> uh, but before... Um, since these are lifetime, these federal judges have lifetime appointments. The Republicans deliberately picked younger people, often not very qualified or experienced, to these uh, high high ranking uh, 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 judicial positions. Um, it's going to be some time, I think, before there can be a real campaign finance reform. Um, in some areas, in some places, uh, states have are starting to employ ranked choice voting, uh, which is had a, uh, I think, a, a, a net positive uh, in, impact, and that you, when you get your ballot, you rank people one, two, three, four, five, or whatever. So it's not just a first past the post you know, kind of thing. Um, so that you know, if, if your first choice candidate doesn't make the first round, your votes go to the, your vote goes to the second choice, et cetera, et cetera, and um, until you get somebody who who uh, wins a majority. I mean that is that's that's one. Um, thing that has been uh, uh, been helpful and and but but you know there are uh, in, in some places uh, people have um, you know, tried to um, make the uh, the political districts uh, that are often uh, designed to uh, support Republican and and, and uh, uh, candidates uh, to, to be more equitable and more uh, representative uh, some states um, uh, you know the, the electoral college system has been challenged, and since that two states have ended up um, having it le- having it winner take all by congressional district, um, and and not not just uh, the winner take all for the entire state. Um, and another reform that a lot of states are doing is that they make a law that their electors have to vote for whoever uh, wins the um, majority of the popular vote, regardless of what the outcome is in their particular state. And um, you know, a number of um, this is not, uh, you know, they're waiting, they're waiting to reach a threshold. Uh, so that would work. 
Uh, but you know, there are there there are a lot of uh, efforts of, of trying to reform. The, th- the problem is, is that a lot of these again, you, you not only have conservative judges, but the Constitution itself. I mean, this is an 18th century, late 18th century document, which, as I mentioned at the outset of the show, was pretty progressive for its time. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it it's uh, you know, it's, it's almost 250 years old now, <laughs> and uh, and it's very hard. And in, in order to change the Constitution, such as abolishing the Electoral College, you need. Um, you need two thirds of both houses of Congress and and the majority of state legislatures in, th- in three quarters of the uh, fifty states. And again, that it's hard to imagine that happening, especially since the Republicans like the system where it is, where you know the, w- the way th- things are right now, that the Electoral College favors the Republican candidates because we've seen how we've uh, you know how twice uh, in the uh, past uh, twenty five years the Republicans that um, lost the popular vote. Uh, ended up getting a majority of the Electoral College and, and becoming mm-hmm. president. Are you co- confident in um, Camelia Harris and Tim Wiss campaign, presidential campaign? Yeah, I, 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 yeah I, I mean, there there are, I'm as, as you know, Marvin, as someone who's interviewed me on, on these sorts of issues for uh, uh, since, uh, since I lived in uh, New Zealand eight years ago and and um, and and since since then, I, I'm quite e- easy to. I have no reservations about criticizing the Democratic Party, even though I'm a registered Democrat myself. But in in, in this case, I'm actually pretty positive about Kamala Harris. I mean, I think she is, uh, you know, uh, one of the most progressive overall uh, nominees the the Democratic Party could reasonably uh, select. Um, she's, she's incredibly smart. I followed her career since she first ran for district attorney in, in San Francisco, um, where I teach and, um, and the convention, um, I mean, political con- convention nowadays are basically long infomercials. <laughs> not, uh, you don't have the, the have the drama, uh, that you, you did in the old days, but, um, it was brilliantly done, brought a whole lot of people together. Now there's a lot of upset because they were, you know, uh, not just because the the platform is pretty bad on issues like Israel and Palestine, um, uh, and, and 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 disappointing in a couple of other areas, but that was primarily written by Biden's people. Um, the big challenge, I think, you know, for um, Kamala Harris is that she is a sitting vice president. And it's very hard for a sitting vice president to become president. Only four have tried since the early 19th century, and three out of the four lost. And it's because that you, you can't openly disagree with your president. It seems as disloyal. It seems as divisive. It would be a big mistake um, politically. Okay. And so on controversial issues like Israel-Palestine, where the Biden administration policy is at odds with the majority of the American people and an overwhelming majority of, of registered Democrats, according to polls, she can do things like emphasize the civilian casualties and the need for a ceasefire and the, and, and the Palestinians' right to self-determination and, and, uh, and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, but she can't openly say we got to s- s- suspend military aid to Israel or a lot of things that uh, most okay. Democrats would like, like her to say. So, so even though I've developed a reputation of someone who's quite willing to – go after Democrats on these types of things. For Kamala Harris, I'm telling people, let's give her some slack. Okay, you're um, optimistic in any case in this particular election. You think she's got a very good chance? As at, this point, it's looking po- at this point, it's looking positive. I mean, also the, the emphasis what we're seeing this year is to get out the vote. As, as, as uh, many of your listeners know, the United States has one of the lowest voter turnout uh, of any advanced industrialized democracy and the people who don't vote are 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 people who would generally if they did vote uh would 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 vote uh democratic okay and so thanks a lot for for this we really appreciate your coming on and let's hope you're right that uh this election will um turn out to be pro-democratic in the bigger sense Thanks. Great, great to be with you again. Good to be. It's good, good to be with you and we'll try again sometime in the n- near future. Definitely. This podcast was produced by ORFM Dunedin with support from New Zealand On the Air.